So I'm going to continue, and this talk is very different to the one before. This is a pure photography talk, uh, and before I get into it, well, when I get into it, I want to give you some background about myself as a, as a photographer and what got me into photography. I picked up a camera in the year 2000, that was very easy, I know exactly how many years I've been photographing, and I quickly realized that when I'm photographing, uh, this is now going back 23 years, that as a photographer I realized that there's something called the photographic process, and that is you've got a camera, you've got a lens, and you've got a light, and you put those three together and you get a photograph. So that was the photographic process. But then I realized, geez, if I take those three things and I move them around and play a bit, I can have the same subject, I can have the same light, and I can have the same camera, but a very different result. So that front lit lion portrait turns into a room lit silhouette. And that opened up my mind to the possibilities of what a camera can do. You're like, whoa, this is a serious device, this that allows you to do that. And it took me on a journey of exploration. I started challenging myself and thinking, you know, how can I experiment with my camera? But look at how this type of image plays with contrast. Your eyes all over the place. Big, white, strong contrast. And that's the power of the image. This is not a great photograph. It's an example of how you can use an image really strongly to divert the eye. You can use layers in a photograph. You think you're looking at an elephant, but these are flying insects in the foreground in the hundreds of millions, if you like. And how white and black can pull your eye away, and the white attracts the eye. So you think your eye goes to the top left because of the snow, the snow over here, but your polar bear is down there. So the white pulls you away from the scree slope. And in the forests of Madagascar, you can use depth of field, so f22 and a wide angle lens to get a great depth into the forest and you think you're looking at a forest landscape, but the subject is right here in front of you, as large as the length of the picture itself, the big leaf-tailed gecko, you can see it there. So the camera is a device that allows you control over all these elements and a lot of illusion can be created. I learned that Photographs and the subject matter don't have to be large in the frame to have impact. A small tree can have as much impact as a large subject in the frame. I'm just going to set this up, sorry, so I, can, I need to see what's the next slide. And this guy, Pablo Picasso, made a very strong argument that photography is art. Because when the French and the English at the same time, they invented photography, this is 1834, the French of course went on a philosophical side. They said, ah, oh, photography, we can do anything we want. And the English would know that photography is a device to document with. We must report to what is seen, like a news article. And so there was this philosophical debate between the two but Picasso drew this with something that doesn't exist. There's no end result. The only end result is that he's taken this light and it's come onto some photographic paper. And so I love the fact that photography is an illusion. And if you can't see dancing ladies in this photograph, then you notice how this can become such an illusion to you. And that's the power of what photography can is. And you have the strength over this box, the camera, to create great photographs. And that led me on a journey as, as a photographer. I was born in the Great Plains of Africa. Um, we were chatting about it earlier. Today, my, my family, one side of my family is uh, sixth generation Africans. They were French Huguenots that came from France to South Africa. And my other family is five generations from Kenya, England to Kenya, and then to South Africa. And I grew up on this continent that offers such diversity. It's a continent of contrast and um, where you can have big, wide open plains like this and strong cultures. And when I picked up this camera 23 years ago, I got attracted as a wildlife naturalist. I studied nature conservation and wildlife management. That was my passion. 
now I had this camera and I was like, what can I do with it? So in order to figure that out, I went on a seven month trip uh, in a Land Rover, myself and the other guy, this is in Amboseli, that's Kilimanjaro in the background. And we spent seven months photographing from, in, from this Land Rover, living the life as wildlife photographers. Everything I owned was inside there. I sold everything else I had and everything I owned was inside that Land Rover. Uh, and that started and planted the seeds for what I do today is that on this journey of showing people and sharing with people what Africa has to offer from you know through to the great big rare and endangered species. I have gone beyond Africa so uh, mainly the polar regions is where we've operated outside of Africa We'll recognize that we, this was not taken on our safari, on our trip, but this is in Svalbard. Uh, it's amazing what a little black box can do for you. It can take you to the subcontinent, to Japan, and to the Falklands, the same beach you had. <laughs> <laughs> to the same beach. Um, yet, you know, I'm always intrigued by what makes a very powerful photograph. You know, there's, there's a trillion photographs taken every single year. So that means there's 3,700 photographs taken every second. So it's like, how do you make your photograph stand out? There has to be a connection in the photograph between you and the image to say what stands out, you know, what makes it jump out at you. And very often it's subconscious. You don't even know about it because we just seeing photographs all the time jumping up. So I'm going to talk about a few elements that you can that can help you to make your photographs st stop somebody, stop the viewer and go why is this photograph stopping me? You know, you've got to get that subconscious connection. There's got to be a pause. And so the title of the, of the talk is called Composition 2. We all know what Composition 1 is, the 101 is rule of thirds, leading lines, put your subjects on the one side, looking into the space of the other side, the very elementary basic ones. This is composition two. How does the image touch you and make you feel? And how do you use your mindset to make the magic in the photograph? Let's just consider this statement that we want to paint the flying spirit of the bird rather than its feathers. We want to smell Africa before we see it. It's the imagination around it. So here's a sequence of photographs. Not bad. Low angle, high impact. I mean this, uh, this elephant's right on top of me. But it lacks a third dimension to me. It, st it stands out nicely. There's a lot of texture in the photograph. But to me, it hasn't got an adjective that I can attach to it. Same here. Here's a wild dog. A lot of elements work together. You have a dark background. You've got the nice light. And this wild dog is walking into the light. Yet, it lacks a, a strong attachment or connection. This is a sand grouse in South Africa. Technically perfect. You know, 3,200th of a second. All the technicals are great, but again, it's got a two-dimensional feel to it. It hasn't got real depth. And then we go back to this photograph. And there's, there's a mystery. There's an energy to the photograph. There's an adjective. You're like, wow, there's power here. There's real uh, energy and power. So these are the adjectives that come up to the photograph. And so that's how I want to speak about how we're going to do this in... <laughs> Um, this talk here and the first one is to chase depth so I have to keep talking about an image being two-dimensional this screen here is a two-dimensional thing there's nothing behind it but yet when you look at this photograph here you get drawn in and that's the classic landscape rules the leading lines so you've got the lines of the sand dune and the clouds also work well and you, you get drawn into that third dimension so it's this classic renaissance uh, rules that you use, you use depth to draw a person into a photograph and create that illusion of the third dimension, even though it's not there. Um, 
foreground and background is another way to use depth. So these are the wide angle landscape rules that we know very, very well. Using a road to lead you into a photograph. Um, it's been done over and over and over again. But how do you do it with wildlife? You've got a long lens. You've got a 300, 400 or 500 millimeter lens. And you want to now engage a sleeping lion and make this into a better photograph. Well, firstly, you wait for the lion to do something. But by lowering the camera, we see the sandbank in the front here. We lower the camera and we create a blurred, out of focus foreground with very sharp middle subject and then a blurred bokeh in the background with the background. So this is probably shot at f4 or f5.6, very wide aperture. But the, the blurring of the foreground makes a mysterious element in the, in the image and creates that, th that extra dimension in the image with depth in it. And that then creates these layers into the photograph and separates the foreground, the middle ground and the background. Being low on the tummy often helps a lot or low down as possible often helps a lot. And these days with our uh, mirrorless cameras we can pull the screen out and I used to lie on the ground a lot now I can just hold the camera down there and take a photograph. So we've got a lot of advantages. So for, for the lion uh, shot, if, if, the, if you are inside the car, how, how can you lower your In that your instance, it's exactly what I did. Yeah, how do you lower your I held the camera inside? and I just held it out the side of the, the vehicle. Oh, and the wow. screen was pointed up. And then I could just push the, the shutter. So yeah, it's exactly what, what I did. And uh, even our, next, our newest uh, safari vehicle that we've just bought, the side doors uh, are open. So you can, be, you can put your camera at the lowest end. We've got a mattress, so you can actually lean down or lie down if you want to get as low as possible. Uh, so here, you know, peering into the little leopard cub's lair and uh, you know, that leaf people go, geez, is it there? But look at the leaves in the foreground here making the V. You're peering in, you're parting, that's the, the feel you get when you have this blurred foreground. It creates this lovely layer leading into this very secretive animal in its very secretive den. This photograph. Recognize your environment. Um, well, you guys are very lucky in, in a way from a photographic perspective because you get such changing weather in this part of the world. In Africa, we often get days and weeks of sunshine like this blue light and it's like, oh, we love, you know, there's no change in the environment. But many, pe and many people put their cameras away when there is bad weather. But photographers should love inclement weather, bad weather because it creates a lovely mood to your photographs and it connects very nicely. So wildebeest in, it, in this instance, they love rain. They've, that's what makes the migration go around in a big circle. They're chasing the rain and the grass from the rain. And so being out when it is raining allows you to capture these images and make a connection between the two. Snow. And snow is also great because now you've got snow like this where we're using a fast shutter speed, a thousandth of a second, and you freeze the snow. But you also get the option of um, blurring the shot. And I think this is a sixtieth of a second. And so you get streaks. And so your creative ability to your discretion comes into play to how you want to control what you have. But you've recognized the environment. And you, know, you might put your camera on one setting in a scenario like this in this photograph and you get back you're like, ah, if I'd just done a few at a sixtieth of a second it's a very different feel to your, to your image but look at where the foreground is we've, we've now blurred the foreground we've created depth in the image and so you get to play then now once you start recognizing these elements ah, this is a sort of portrait mode symmetrical shot because of the design on the penguin's face and we have the speckles of snow. This is what we do get a lot of, is dust. And again, it creates a lovely mood and atmosphere in your photographs. And allows you to exp experiment. So this is a lens, a, a, this is a shot 
at a 400 millimeter lens compressing all the dust and this is at a much wider 25, 24 millimeters or so. And when you recognize your environment and you recognize the elements that make the image strong, so in this instance it's the snow and the intent on the eagle's talent and the eagle's face, you can then be, be uh, extreme and crop half of the animal out. Most people go, well, wh where's the wings? But in this image it's not about the wings, it's about the face, the talons, and the snow, all on the same plane working together. So you, can, you have the opportunity to crop further into your photographs. And in this instance here, we're only about 10 meters away from a polar bear, but recognizing the environment, there was a snow, uh, sorry, a fog bow going over the image, and so with a wide angle lens, capture the animal in the environment surrounded by the fog bow. Balance. And many people think that's 50 50. It means that the bright area holds a lot more weight than the dark area. And so, therefore, the light area is a much smaller area than the competing dark area itself. And that provides the balance. The three hikers are the added uh, small elements to the photograph, and they are the cherry on top because your eye goes there. But the balance of the image is held by the smaller bright area being surrounded by the larger dark area. Sometimes you need an abstract to make you feel balanced, but that doorway, the dark doorway there is very dark and you're drawn into it in this photograph. You're drawn into that dark, dark doorway, so it has to be balanced by a much larger, wider, brighter, striped area. These oryx on the dunes classic scene of Namibia and if it wasn't for that dark dune at the bottom here, this here, if I'd crop this image just here, this whole image wouldn't have balance. It would have scale, yes, small, small uh, oryx against the big dunes, but having this dark element here provides a very strong balance and anchors the photograph against the vast uh, dunes above the oryx over there. So finding balance is a very important element. Scale 2. Scale 1 is when people say you put something small like a zebra against a big sky. And that's I say scale 1 because we can put anything against a big sky and there's no real relation. And this image is very flat. But when you connect the two you're starting to make, get some context going. And this is starting to work because rain, trees need rain for life. Uh, but we go broader sometimes and then we really get the impact that we require out of scale. And so once you make that connection, you can then experiment. Just like with the eagle and the snow, this is a composition where the zebra is looking almost out the frame. And many people think, well, why should naturally you'd want the zebra on the bottom right looking into the frame? But with a bit of tension uh, that, that that causes, that tension is balanced by the strong connection of the zebra and the sky. And I love, in this in image, the stripes of the zebra versus the circles of the clouds. That's the connection. It's a creative connection and not necessarily a rain and tree connection over here. So this image, and, and as a recognition of, a, of an image that I thought, well, this is a challenging composition. This image was bought by somebody <coughs> as a, as a one-of-one, one. so never to be repeated again. And um, lastly is respect your subject. When you're taking a photograph, any photograph, with your iPhone or with um, your latest SLR camera, Respect what your subject is doing because you, in order to get the best photograph. And in some instances, <coughs> you're not going to be going back there again or very soon. And so you make sure that you spend the time to get the shot that you want. There's no coincidence that that penguin on the bottom left, right, 
is looking to the side like that. His head was looking at me all the time and I just wait, you had to wait and wait and then he turns his head, that's what holds the photograph. Because, and so there should never be a coincidence in your, in your photographs. Because that's ultimately what makes the big difference. It's that one shot out of the 20 that you take, you can discard the rest. It's always the one. There's no coincidence here that there's this transition of the penguins going into the water. And if that man's feathers on his head had touched the horizon, the shot's not going to work. There's no, you've, you've lost a shot. And so it's a small adjustment on your tripod to bring your camera up a little bit higher. Uh, because here you can see the water is blurry, so it's a one second exposure. But there shouldn't be a coincidence. I mean, you, you travel all the way to northern Kenya, this guy is standing in the water. You're gonna, you want to get your, your photograph and make sure that all the elements are working. And similarly here, uh, just the way you shuffle on the ground is going to make that connection between the triangle in the cloud, and the, or the V, and the triangle in the stick on the man over here. Very small movements that you make make a massive difference in the end result of your photographs. I like this example not because it's the best photograph but because if that elephant down here hadn't picked up his trunk and curled it you wouldn't probably even see it or notice that it's an elephant in the photograph. You'd just think it's a whole group of trees framing a dot. And so the gesture of that elephant is very important in the photograph um, for you to notice, even though it's very small. And waiting for the right moment for the starling to fly through the center of the frame. So there shouldn't be any coincidence in how you do that. I've just noticed something. Wow, piece of magic. This but the tree yeah, trunk is this. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the first time I've seen that. Hmm, interesting. So that um, that is the the talk on giving your images an emotion, a feel, and, and an energy, and it's very basic elements, I believe that you can apply. Uh, this morning we were walking, we were getting some lead, I was taking some pictures of a building and getting some leaves in front. On an iPhone it doesn't work necessarily as well, it's nicer when you've got a, a longer lens to compress the view. But as long as you recognize these elements of chasing depth, um, finding balance in your photograph, respecting your subject, respecting your environment, recognizing your environment, your images will continually improve. And that's what we do as photographers. We want to continually improve our images and evolve as photographers. And I've been a photographer that's always wanted to share. Initially, we want to share our photographs. We go out there, want people to see our photographs, we want to produce books or prints. And it's a great thing to do, but my life has always been about sharing with others. The knowledge I have, the experience I have of traveling in Africa, for the last 25 years um, and that you know leads to some really amazing experiences and, and times as a photographer itself and I, I photograph everything I photograph from the big cats through to the small stuff the really small stuff but as my photography changed and grew and I've got lots of talks about this uh, I tried to become a little bit more creative but I also wanted to evolve my photography so an image of an elephant running I wanted to photograph more about the connection between the elephant and the, and the environment and the birds that fly around the uh, elephants while they're feeding and it leads you on a journey because now you're saying okay well I don't just want to photograph the elephant I want to photograph the interactions and then you think well what else is there and you think oh, but, and you know you can photograph animals and make them abstract so it's the palette that is provided in this instance that makes the photograph. The, it's not about the giraffe. We've abstracted the giraffe. He's just the background for these birds over here. And that led me to another type of photography. And that is photographing cultures of Africa. And initially it started like this. Portraits. Because that's all I could think of. You know, you start working with these cultures. 
And so I'm photographing portraits and we're using a reflector here to get the light on the face. Uh, but it did take me on a bit of a journey. And initially I started photographing cultures um, set back. So more travel style images. Because that's what made me feel more comfortable. And so I was photographing people in their environment, travel logs of people and portraits. That was about as strong as I got as a portrait. Here's the wider shots of the guys fishing. This is all from Lake Turkana in Kenya where fishing is a big part of their culture. I don't know why that image is so small. So the documentative type of shots. But in what they do, there's also a lot of abstract. And this is the fish they're drying. And then I thought to myself, geez, there's a lot more to going on about their photography here to photograph. And I should be a bit more abstract. And so this is the process I'm trying to talk about, the, the process of evolution. And so my photography became way different when photographing uh, these people. I started high key uh, exposure. So exposing pretty much like 1.7 overexposure to get a nice white canvas. I set back against the environment. We saw this picture a few seconds ago. And I also recognized the color that uh, is so strong in some of these cultures over here. And this, this is a shop front. It's not a studio. <laughs> uh, and this is again a, a, sh a shop front. And so I thought to myself, how can I evolve my photography? So the first thing I thought of is, what's my reference point? My reference point is wildlife. I've been photographing wildlife for 17, 20 years. So that's my reference point. I thought, so how, does, how do I make that the same? And I started working on combining those elements from wildlife through to culture. And that changed the perspective of how I photographed um, these, pe these people, these cultures. And then I went a step further. I said, you know, the giraffe and the, um, the birds on the giraffe's back, that, the giraffe's back is actually just the background. So what if these, guys, the, these cultures have such strong design elements? What if I abstract the, the design? And it's not about the human, it's about the beauty of their design that they have. And so I've focused even tighter on those elements. And by, and by abstra abstracting, I remove the personal elements and focus on the beauty of what they do. And some of them are very candid shots. Just a guy crossing his hands. And sometimes they don't even know how beautiful just their basic design is. And I think this shot, this next photograph, is not the greatest shot, but it speaks to me of now what I have been attempting. So I'm continually trying to push boundaries and attempting different shots. I would never have considered photographing a, a scene like this, with, and attempting a scene like this, five years ago, never mind 20 years ago. But you've got to keep trying. You've got to keep trying. And this was not necessarily a success for me, but this became a success for me. And this is an image that has done very well over the last few years. And so abstracting the culture has become a brilliant, for me, evolution in how I photograph. And it's something that you never know with photography where you are going to go. And the more you push your boundaries, the process continues. Because when I started these projects, I never knew where it was going. But last year I got the opportunity to start working on a project which I'm in the midst of right now. And that's a large format book project focusing on the Rift Valley of Africa, which is the largest geological formation in the world. And so these images then become very relevant because they can be used in a project like this. You'll see that, that red line going through, that is the Rift Valley of Africa, um, which incorpor incorporates wildlife, it incorporates all the best areas of Africa, wildlife-wise, the Maasai Mara, the Zambezi Valley. Um, it's conservation. It's 
uh, culture and of course uh, our origins. The origin of man comes from the Rift Valley in Africa. So that gives you an idea of just you know, utilizing your photography and how you can change what you do by working on a process. And I'm going to then slide straight into this little sequence here, which speaks about how this written word can mean so much in photography. And we start with the word intent. Now, the definition here is intent or purpose, showing earnest or eager attention. And in the business world, intent is very often a negative. The intent was to uh, make money. <laughs> the intent was to, to execute a task. But something went wrong and it didn't happen. In sports, the person was supposed to pass the ball to the other person. He missed and this try or this it was never scored. There was never a try or a goal happened. So we tend to use it in a very negative part. And now to emphasize on process, intent in photography is about a process. So here's a sequence. Namibia, just after the rain, so the grass is long and nice white puffy clouds. What's the first thing you do when you pick up a camera? You take a shot. And you look at it and you go, ah, no. That's immediately the process of intent that has just started in your photography. And so you think, how do I make a better photograph? And you go lower, crop it, I put some grass in the foreground to try to get some depth. Negative, not going to work. I tilted the frame up. Two thirds land, one third sky, still not there. I tried a different lens, 600 millimeter lens, because under one of those trees was an oryx standing there. Not bad, but still it's, it's a process that's working through. And that's the end result. It was a black and white conversion of the scene. Very high contrast, so we get nice depth between the sky and the clouds in the background, and a nice definition on the land between the, the dark um, shadows over there. But all this required a process, and that process required intent. And in photography, how many of us have just walked up to a scene, picked up our camera and said, oh, I've got it, and walked away? It's never like that. It's, you always go there and think, how can I make this image a little bit better? And you take a few, and you're learning from that in the process. And so the, the process of intent is very important in photography. Tension. Um, applying a force which tends to stretch it. Sometimes it's a mental force, but it can also be physical. So this is a very literal photograph of tension. And this crocodile is being attacked by some hippopotamus. That's a very tense situation. You know? It's like people fighting. Uh, but tension can be something completely different. And these are spines on an aloe, and the, sh the strong shadows create a strong visual tension. You immediately go, what is going on here? And so people think tension might be negative, but in photography, what is, what's it doing? It's drawing you in. Your eyes going, what's going on here? You know, what's happened? This is a high key photograph in Japan. The crane had put its head into its body, and this is the result of that shot. So it's a high key shot, but the tension in the image makes you look a little bit longer. And that's what we want as photographers to draw people in. Franz Lunting the, um, is a well known American photographer down in Santa Cruz. He said, one of the best things to do when you do a portrait is put the person or your subject right next to the center of a photograph. So we, we are always taught that the center of a photograph, that middle point, is the weakest point of a photograph. Um, and so if you put the subject just to the center but just offset it, when you look at the image, your subconscious is going, is it in the center or not? It's asking this question. It's going back and forth. And that's what holds the eye that one second, millisecond longer than the next. Exploring the unknown, and that leads to imagination. To explore the unknown, you need imagination. Because you want new ideas, images, concepts, um, not present to the senses at this right moment. And that's what I love about photography, is that when you head out in the morning, you've got a camera with an empty card, and you're going out to create. 
And it's only your imagination is what's going to put those images onto that card. I was photographing in a reserve in um, South Africa for about four months on a project on birds. I was with snipes. And uh, my wife came along one afternoon to join me and she took this photograph, not of the snipes, because I was photographing. And this is one of the most amazing photographs because the, the grass is in focus, all on the same plane, and it mirrors the background so nicely. And the color palette is works, works so nicely. So this is the one that's framed in our house, rather than the bird photographs <laughs> that never made it. Just think of imagination. People say, you know, what are you going to see tomorrow? And this is a very rare instance. That it's a chick of a bird that is very rare. And you, if you just go out into wild, you keep thinking. People always say, when are you going to see a sand grass chick? And you say, never. But one day it happens. And this was only a couple of years ago, just seeing this for the first time. And letting your imagination literally slide. You know, you're photographing from the air. This is a pond of water. But when you look again, it's a burnt field with a human footprint on it. <clears throat> and I think that leads us to the sentence. So I'm talking about words and how they affect <laughs> images. The sentence is how we communicate. Uh, English has got 26 letters in it. Chinese, about over a thousand. Yeah, more. <laughs> yeah. Most people. Four <laughs> but many, many more. But let me stick with English. This is the best example I know because it's got 26 letters. And so everybody who speaks English has the same access to the letters to communicate with. But some people communicate better and some worse. And when it comes to writing the sentence, some write better and some worse. But there's a paradox because the best authors have a vocabulary that is incredibly massive and now you think of poetry and yet then what do they do they, they learn all these words and they use only very specific words to they want less words in a sentence to make the strongest impact now look at this photograph here this is okay sorry I'm going back uh, This is the word, this image. It's an exclamation. It's a, it's, there's not much sentence to this photograph. It's, high, it's impact it's in your face, and there's only one word that you can attribute to it. That's what I would argue. And I just want you to consider this, these two sentences, is that consulting the rules of composition before taking a photograph is like consulting the laws of gravity before going for a walk. And then... These Dutchmen were hardly, had hardly any imagination or fantasy, but their good taste and their scientific knowledge of composition were enormous. Basically saying, Vincent van Gogh was saying that people had no imagination, but they could understand what the book said completely. And if we look at this photograph, when you first look at it, it's, it's quite a basic photograph, but the elements are all aligned very, very specifically. There's no coincidence that that giraffe is right underneath the peak of that mountain and the sun is offset to the right like that with a lot of sky lying on our bellies to get the full profile of that giraffe. So this is an image that speaks to a sentence where there's many elements and each word stands out and jumps out at you. And so I want you to consider this image which is a leopard leaping out of the tree in the Maasai Mara and then add some words to it that in the fell clutch of circumstance I have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeonings of chance my head is bloody but unbowed and the whole mood of the image changes <coughs> that now this image is sorry now this leopard is leaping out with a purpose heading off onto its nightly pursuits it's gone from being an image of loneliness and a worry about the leopard. Now it changes to something very different. And so let's look at these words, which are written by Henri Cartier-Bresson. He's a very well-known French photographer. There's a harmony discovered precisely by the balance between prose and poetry. 
it is composition with rhythm. Most images succumb to a number of rules because without them you achieve only a messy sentimentality. So he speaks here of a very romantic way of composing, sentiment, uh, sorry, a composition with rhythm. He's almost speaking musically, talks about there's this balance between prose and poetry. And we look at this image here, which we've already seen today. Have a look at this and just look, read these three sentences here. Great images are governed, sorry, great images are emotions that are governed by rules. Imagination restrained by discipline and serendipity governed by geometry. <coughs> and we look at that image again. The rules have all been broken here. There's a lot of serendipity. We're in a vehicle, we've got, we've got some uh, elevation, so that's a serendipitous moment. I've, a lot of rules have been broken, but there's a harmony within that image. And we look at this photo here, and the words attributed to it. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan. Earth stood hard as an iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow. In the bleak midwinter, long ago. We look at those words, snow on snow, snow on snow. And we go, well, that's incorrect. In pure English terms, that's written incorrectly. And this is the paradox of being a good author or a poet. Like Gerald Durrell, sorry, we're like Rudyard Kipling wrote when the, How the Elephant Got Its Trunk. He said the crocodile grabbed his nose and he pulled, 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 and pulled the trunk of the elephant. And that English is incorrect. Yet, it's one of the reasons he became such a good author, was that he broke the rules. He was willing to break the rules in order to make a statement about his photography. And we look at poetry like this, it's snow on snow, snow on snow. And they break the rules, but by doing so, make a strong statement. And so, perhaps we, as photographers, should consider our compositions in service of a little more poetry. In poetry, we want the words to leap off the page. So when we look at our photographs, we want the elements of that composition to leap off the page and dance to the viewer. So I'll just end with this one. We are not now that strength which in old days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are, one equal temper of a heroic heart, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Yeah. I think that's a fitting end to today's talk and presentation. I would go there, but well, let me go there. It's a more beautiful ending. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.